Jared Spire is an associate in Stradling's Employment Law Practice Group and represents clients in several industries, including financial services, medical devices, retail, logistics, and manufacturing. He uses his varied experience to provide unique insights into how industries can benefit from lessons learned in other lines of business. Jared has defended and settled numerous matters in both state and federal court in various arbitral forums, including FINRA. Jared has also guided clients through the COVID-19 and general employment law compliance. With that, Jared, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. So I'll just jump right into it. So uh, as we, we've come accustomed to the with COVID, uh, employment law never stands still and it moves at a pretty fast pace. So let's get into it. So this is me. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is severance agreements. There was a big change this year as of January 1. So when you're looking at severance agreements, whether it's for you or for someone at your company, there's gonna be a few things that you wanna be aware of. So first and foremost, settlement agreements, which includes severance agreements, if there's a pending claim, uh, cannot prevent disclosure of information related to that civil action if it relates to uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment, discrimination. And that existed prior to this year. However, that has been expanded quite a bit. Um, it cannot restrict as well as prevent disclosure. So you've got to have pretty broad language in your settlement and severance agreements that allow people to speak about you know, sexual assault, sexual harassment, or any form of discrimination uh, that occurred in the workplace. Um, so if any of your agreements that have been, you know, uh, signed prior or post January 1, 22, uh, have that information, you should be aware of that that's a risk and that the entire agreement as a result could be voided. Um, so going forward, make sure your model agreements include language like that. Um, so you can't include in any agreement, I would include a severance or separation agreement. Uh, that prevents any dis uh, disclosure of unlawful acts in the workplace. So this one is a little bit different. If you have a severance agreement, you can't pro prohibit disclosure of unlawful acts. So that could be anything, even discrimination or any financial um, um, uh, unlawful act or anything. So you can't prevent any disclosure of that. So it does reduce the value of your non-disparagement provisions um, or confidentiality provisions in your severance and settlement agreements, but it's something that if you included information restricting that disclosure, the entire agreement could be blown up. Um, so unlawful acts in the workplace, uh, not, again, it extends beyond, oops, where'd I go? Um, it extends beyond just harassment and discrimination uh, that being said, the agreement can still preclude disclosure of the amount paid in the severance agreement, which is very valuable. Um, we've had agreements that have leaked out and we've been able to enforce those and basically claw back that money because the whole point or one of the main points of a severance agreement is that you don't want other employees uh, thinking they can get the same thing. Um, so it sort of preserves your negotiations in that one situation and doesn't set you up for paying the same or more in a subsequent situation. Uh, you can still include a general lease or waiver of all claims. So what that means in this situation is, while they can disclose information about unlawful acts to maybe an administrative agency or somebody else, they themselves will have waived those claims. So they're not gonna be able to then sue you for that, um, but they still can talk about it. And you can still include protection for trade secrets, proprietary information, other confidential lawful information, uh, the disclosure, uh, you just can't prevent disclosure of unlawful information. Um, so in addition to that, uh, the new changes require that you have to notify the employee, the separated employee of their right to consult an attorney that has to be expressed in the agreement. You have to give them five business days to do it. Uh, so not just five days, it has to be five, you know, Monday through Friday days. Um, the employee can sign prior to that. However, you should include language that if they do so, that they're doing so is voluntary and not induced by fraud, misrepresentation or anything of that sort. Uh, because if they sign you know, prior to the five business days without that language, they can come back and claim that you strong on them into doing it. Um, 
So this is just a little bit more information. I included it. I'm not really going to go over it in too much detail. You're going to have the, uh, um, the recording, but if you want the slides, I can make those available too. So uh, just let me know where to send those and we can just send out the slides so you don't have to fast forward and rewind through the whole presentation to get where you want to go. Um, so this is the, this is the, I gave you the snapshot here. This is what the information you, or I'm sorry, the text that you need to include in your agreement. It's that middle bullet point. Nothing in this agreement prevents you from discussing or disclosing information about unlawful acts in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the information pulled directly from the statute. Copy and paste that into a non-disparagement or confidentiality provision, and then you're good to go, at least for that requirement. Um, and then the prior three bullet points, you know, got to tell them they can get an attorney five business days, but still can waive other things. Those, those should be in the agreement as well. Um, and again, any agreement that violates these requirements is automatically unenforceable if, if it was challenged in court. So make sure that you're aware of these and it's included in your agreements. So this is the one that's ever changing. Uh, I've been in the middle of writing an email advising a client on COVID guidance and the law has changed. <laughs> so I deleted everything out of the email and just said, you know, it's going to take me a little bit longer to get back to you. The law has completely changed. <laughs> so the law completely changed uh, at the end of the last year with respect to how long people have to be out of work and when they can come back. So as we become accustomed, you know, now that we're good gracious and almost two years of pandemic come March. Um, the Kalish ETS is a comprehensive standard that was put out in November of 2020. Um, it, although it had had time to be analyzed, it is still unclear in many respects. Um, so we've got two bodies. We've got the Kalosha ETS, and we've got the California Department of Health. Both have been issuing guidance throughout the pandemic, but sometimes it conflicts. So in December, there was an executive order issued saying that the CDPH, California Department of Public Health, isolation and quarantine guidance now trumps the Kalosh ETS. Now, if you look in the Kalosh ETS, the, the guidance there, it doesn't say anything about that. So it's very unclear. Um, and with and a lot of my clients didn't know this until we put out an alert on it, that the Kalosha, even though it gives you all what you need to do, that doesn't apply, even though it looks like it applies from the language of the statute. You've got to plug in the CDPH guidance. So as of December 30 of the, the last year, the CDPH requirements have applied over and above the ETS requirements. So when you're applying these, how long do people have to stay out of work? Who gets uh, put out of work after an exposure, after testing positive? I find it helpful to put employees in three groups, and then there's two scenarios that can apply to each of those groups. So the three groups are unvaccinated, which means that they you know, don't have both shots of Pfizer or Moderna, or they haven't, don't have any shots, um, or they're booster eligible, meaning that six months have passed since their last dose of the regular regimen of the vaccine, or two, dose, or two months have passed since receiving the J&J &J vaccine. So that's what booster eligible means. Or they're vaccinated and not booster eligible or boosted. So that means that that time frame has not yet elapsed, or they in fact have that third or in the case of Johnson & Johnson, second shot. So the two scenarios are an employee test positive or an employee comes in close contact. So close contact means 15 minutes of exposure over the course of a 24 hour period. So this is again, who is unvaccinated. I provided this to you uh, just so you have it. Uh, but again, unvaccinated, no shots or not the full regimen. And then those are the timeframes for booster eligible. So exclusion requirements after a positive test. So this means that employee has an at-home antigen test, PCR test, doesn't matter. They've tested positive. Now it doesn't matter whether they're boosted, booster eligible, unvaccinated, they have to be excluded from the workplace. And that means for at least five days. They can return after five days with a negative test, but they have to wear a well-fitting mask. It doesn't have to be an N95. It just has to be a mask that you would otherwise require. They have to wear that for 10 days. The regulation says 10 days after the positive test, but just it's five days after they come back after five days. Um, and if they're unable to test or refuse to test after that five-day period, they can return after 10 days if they don't have a fever and their symptoms are getting better. Um, so again, that's regardless of whether they're boosted or anything like that, they have to stay out for five days. 
So exclusion requirements after a close contact. Close contact, again, means six within six feet for 15 minutes in a 24-hour period. But there is a not very often exception taught that's taught or not very often talked about exception that if they're wearing a NIOSH approved respirator, they are not a close contact. So we've been advising clients that don't have the opportunity to socially distance in the workspace that if you have an ample supply of N95s or other NIOSH approved uh, respirators, again, that does not include KN95s, um, that it's worth having people wear them. We've had clients avoid outbreaks, you know, having avoid having to report things to OSHA because of this. So I think it's been really helpful. And I think it's something that not a lot of people talk about. Um, if, especially if you've got N95s, I would require people to wear them, maybe just in meetings or something like that. So you can avoid exclusions from pe of people from work. So if they're unvaccinated after a close contact, again, there's been some confusion on this. It doesn't matter whether you've had COVID in the last 90 days. There's a difference between the CDC guidance on this and the CDPH guidance. According to the CDC, if you've had an exposure within the last 90 days, you don't need to be excluded from work after an exposure. However, that doesn't apply over this California guidance, which doesn't make that same exception. So yeah, I've had to deal with employees complaining about, well, I've, I've, I've already had COVID. I you know, have the antibodies. Well, I'm sorry. According to the California guidance, that really doesn't matter. You still got to stay out of work. And so unvaccinated, you basically, it's the same requirements after an employee tests positive. Excluded for five days, should probably test on day five. They can return if they're asymptomatic with that negative test on day five. But again, they've got to wear the mask for the next five days. But if they can't test or are unable to or refuse to, then they can't return for 10 days. So again, employees, especially those who cannot work from home, it's probably good to try and enforce that N95 requirement so it doesn't cause a disruption in the workplace. Booster eligible. Again, this is before that six months has passed after the regimen of vaccines or uh, before two months has passed since J&J. &J. Uh, they can return to work after three days. This is after exposure. If they receive a negative test after three days and they have to wear a mask for the next seven days, again, it's still that same 10 day window. And then again, unable to refuse the test, can't return for 10 days. So vaccinated, but not booster eligible. So that time period hasn't run or they're boosted. These people do not have to be excluded if they're asymptomatic after an exposure. So this is a major benefit to having boosted employees or recently vaccinated employees. Um, we've had employers reissue uh, vaccination verification policies, and that's not a vac vaccination mandate. That is simply saying, hey, please update us as to your vaccination status, you know, fill out this form. Um, and then that way you have a good idea who's boosted and who's not, so you can know who has to be excluded and who doesn't. Um, the guidance says that they should test their after day five. Again, that's not required though, uh, but they should wear a face covering for 10 days following exp exposure. Right now there's masking re uh, requirements out in most counties. Those a lot in a lot of counties, those are set to expire. I know Santa Barbara, where I am, just extended theirs, but I think Orange County is expiring soon. So those don't, these masking requirements don't really matter in those cases uh, if the mask mandate is still in effect. However, once that expires, then this will matter. Um, so what happens if an exposed employee later tests positive? That means you just pick them up and drop them into that bucket, that first bucket where they tested positive. Doesn't matter if they've been excluded for five days already, that timeline restarts on that positive test. Um, and then a question that we get a lot is, so an employee tests positive and they test on day five. What happens if that day five test comes back positive? And a lot of the times it does because um, we had uh, one of the medical, medical directors that we use as, uh, for guidance on medical issues here in Santa Barbara said that she calls it testing for a cure. If you test for a cure on day five, it's almost always gonna come back positive. So again, if testing is scarce in your area, you may not wanna even go there because you're gonna to have to pay the cost of testing as the employer uh, when you require them to go out and get that test. And if it's gonna come back positive anyways, what's the point? But that timeline does not restart on that second positive test. So employees out for five days, test positive on the fifth day, 
they do not have to restart that 10 day timeline. They get to come back after 10 days after that first positive test. So again, it's, uh, this is not spelled out exactly in the guidance, but for all intents and purposes, that is the requirement. Um, so again, weigh the, weigh the pros and cons of asking for that test on the fifth day, uh, because most likely it's gonna come back positive. Um, that's just been the case uh, throughout the pandemic, employees can test positive for up to 90 days. So uh, just weigh, weigh the options there, especially if there's really long lines at the testing facility, you have to pay for that time. So if an employee is sitting in line for three hours, that's three hours of working time. So again, it can be more trouble than it's worth. So if an employee can work remotely and there's really no disruption, maybe just have them work remotely because they're excluded from the workplace even after testing positive, if they're willing and able to work and they're not too sick to do so, they can still work remotely. Um, does the employee have symptoms? Again, if they have symptoms, it's probably better that they get tested. Uh, they're at a higher risk uh, for contracting a more serious uh, uh, reaction to, the, to COVID. So should probably get tested just to make sure uh, that it's still there. Um, and then the cost of testing, I think one of the things I just talked about, just all things to consider when you're asking employees to go get tested. Um, so except for these exclusion requirements, the ETS continues to control. So that means that just this minor subsection of who gets excluded and when, and when they can come back to work, that's the CDPH world. But everything else in the ETS, training requirements, the fact that you have to have a written prevention plan, uh, what happens during an outbreak, all that stuff is still under controlled under the ETS. That means exclusion pay still applies. So, um, excuse yeah. me, Jared, I'm yeah. seeing someone's raising a hand. Uh, Jonathan, you might want to unmute and uh, make your point or question, please. Uh, uh, sorry, I mean, I mean, there was some problem with my laptop. I, I actually wanted to ask a question. Um, uh, regarding the prior section, I'll wait till he finishes. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Um, great. So exclusion pay. This, um, a lot of times employers kind of forget about it, but if an employee is exposed at work and there is a presumption that an employee is exposed at work, unless you have evidence otherwise. So employee says, hey, I, um, I was exposed to COVID-19 and I've now tested positive. And now you have to immediately ask, well, where did you get, get exposed? If they say, I don't know, there is a presumption that it was at work. And that means you're now in exclusion pay territory, which, which means you have to pay that employee, regardless of whether they have sick time, regardless of vacation, regardless of anything, you have to pay them for the time they're out of work. So if an employee can work remotely, great. They just continue to work. They work from home. Um, if you have a supplemental sick leave policy, and that does not count against this new supplemental sick leave that just got approved yesterday uh, by the California legislature, but if you had an alternate supplemental sick leave policy, they could use that sick leave and not get paid exclusion pay. However, they can't use their standard 30 hours or however much sick leave you provide and avoid exclusion pay. Um, if also, if they're getting workers comp payments, you don't need to pay exclusion pay. But aside from those exceptions, you need to continue paying employees at their regular rate if they're excluded from a workplace due to a workplace exposure. Um, we just had one employee discover this, or I'm sorry, employer discover that they weren't doing this. Um, and it results in potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in liability. Um, you can look up the Cal OSHA citations. There was one employer who had, I think it was a couple hundred employees, so they were fairly large, but they were not paying exclusion pay. So they needed to then repay all the exclusion pay. It was several months worth of pay for a couple hundred employees, as well as pay steep penalties. And it was almost half a million dollars. So again, it's really important that you are aware of this requirement and that you conduct an investigation immediately or refer to your workers' comp carrier, all your COVID claims to conduct the investigation. Uh, so they can determine that it was not a uh, workplace, a workplace related exposure. And that sort of gets you off the hook for paying this exclusion pay. So additional revisions that were implemented to the ETS on January 14, uh, there's different testing requirements, new face covering definition and notice requirements. Um, 
So tests now for COVID cannot be both self-administered and self-read. What that means is you cannot require employees to do an at-home test that's not observed by you, the employer. Um, so we've had employee, employers set up Zoom uh, to watch employees take their tests. Um, if, and then we've had employers that say that's bit too big of an administrative burden. I've got way too many employees to try and figure out you know, scheduling for all of that. So then they just move solely to a PCR uh, lab testing. So acceptable tests can still include those that you do at home, but then send into a lab for testing or analysis. Um, or those, you know, maybe the easiest solution is just to send them out uh, to the lab uh, to go get have the test administered and analyzed. Um, so again, there's really a there's one instance where an at-home test could still be could still be useful. Um, so if they're boosted or not yet booster eligible and they're exposed to COVID, they do not need to be excluded from the workplace. So they could use an at-home test at work and that could be employer observed. So that's basically the one slight exception to not really allowing the at-home testing anymore. Um, I guess Cal OSHA, Cal OSHA put the, out these regulations well before the Omicron spike and testing became super scarce. So it's, um, it wasn't great foresight on their part um, <clears throat> because now, you know, it just creates a whole nother administrative burden. But again, it's the requirements um, and we sort of have to live with them. So uh, new face camera requirements, the cloth. So if not a surgical mask or N95, if it's a cloth, it can still be a cloth mask, but it cannot let light pass through. There is zero guidance on what that means, what the light source is, whether it's the sun, whether it's, you know, um, what sort of light, if it's UV light or anything like that. But again, I think, you know, trying to comply, you know, it goes a long way with Cal OSHA. So if someone's wearing a cloth mask that's one ply, you know, mesh, you know, obviously that's not going to pass. But I would most cloth, most, if not all the cloth masks I see are two layers and are going to comply with this requirement. Gator style masks are appropriate, but have to have two layers. So people kind of just fold them over on top of each other and that's okay. But again, obvious, it's probably obvious to everybody, but if your mask has holes in it, punctures, if it's mesh, or if it doesn't fit snugly over your nose and mouth, it's not going to be okay. Um, so sort of obvious updates, but the one that about let, letting light pass through has created a bunch of ire. Um, however, it's something that Cal OSHA thought was important and we need to let you guys know about. So the definition of worksite, and this where this definition comes into play is when you're sending out the notice to all employees that you had a COVID exposure at the workplace. So that's got to happen within 24 hours of knowing that there was a COVID uh, case, so someone with COVID at the workplace. So within 24 hours, you've got to send out a notice to everybody at the work site. And that doesn't just mean everybody that person came into contact with. That means everybody in the building, everybody in the facility, everybody in the agriculture field or other location where that person was present during the high-risk exposure period. And what the high-risk exposure period is, is two days before the positive test and 10 days after. So if an employee comes in on Wednesday and they test positive, comes in on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they end up testing positive on Wednesday, everybody that was in the facility Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday needs to get this notice. But it obviously, you know, another sort of obvious update, but something that was a question before was locations where the worker worked by themselves without exposure to other employees. So if this person goes in a back door and just uses an office by themselves or they work from home, uh, you're obviously not going to uh, send out the notice to everybody in, their, in the facility where they're normally stationed had they not been working from home. Um, so again, sort of an obvious update, but something that was a long time coming uh, for the ETS. So uh, this is just the general notification requirement. Um, just wanted to put here a little bit of sort of the high points for it so you'd have it. But again, it shouldn't reveal any personal identifying information. You, you shouldn't say John Smith tested positive, everybody. We, you know, he really, you know, shouldn't have been at work, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, that's a no-no. Um, notice must also include your disinfection plan. That means, you know, we're hiring a third-party person to come in and clean the space or we conducted our own cleaning. It just needs to have what you're going to be doing to mitigate the risks. 
um, and it has to be sent to all employees and independent contractors at that work site during that high risk exposure period. Again, this is a big one. Uh, Amazon recently got hit for this pretty good. Again, they have a huge amount of employees and this was in one of their distribution facilities. So they're pretty high risk of exposure, um, but they got fined for 500 grand and now they're under constant surveillance by the attorney general. So that you don't want that to be you. Um, and so it's really important to be uh, aware of this notification requirement and send out that notice within 24 hours of knowledge of that COVID uh, case in the workplace. So more changes, vaccination mandate. This one has been the uh, in the headlines um, of late and as of being before the Supreme Court. So employers of 100 or more, that is now stayed and withdrawn. Um, that, that regulation is completely dead. Uh, OSHA has made some veiled comments that it may be bringing it back on a different scale, you know, bringing back vac this vaccination mandate for certain types of employers, or um, it's just not really clear yet. So not really something to worry about, but something maybe to, if you see a headline about it in a few months to look at. But again, this one's completely dead, uh, not worth worrying about anymore. Uh, there was a mandate for federal contractors that's now put on hold. Um, so anybody doing contracts with the federal government was under that, but now that's stayed. So not really needing to worry about it anymore. Um, until you see a headline saying it's back on. Healthcare providers, that one is the one that's moving forward. Um, they, need to do a, they need to establish a policy by February 13, and vaccination is required of all healthcare employees by March 15. Not a huge impact on California employers uh, as they were under healthcare employers, as they were already under a vaccination mandate uh, prior to this. So these rulings do not prevent an employer from implementing their own mandate. Um, we've seen a uh, less attention pointed toward vaccination mandates of late due to Omicron and its transmissibility, uh, given that, you know, you're vaccinated, you can still get it, although it's, the data shows it's pretty important to get the vaccination because it results in lower sickness. Uh, but so we still have employers moving forward with vaccination mandates, but again, it's not as high a priority as it was with the Delta and prior variants. But now that there's no vaccination mandate from the federal government, um, you can be pretty flexible with how you want to mandate vaccinations. You can mandate the vaccine for a certain subset of your workers that can't work, you know, um, outside of six feet of one another. You can uh, mandate vax, or you can have a mask vaccination or masking requirement or va vaccination or testing requirement. Um, <clears throat> so it really frees you up to do kind of whatever you want um, in the workplace with respect to requiring vaccination. Um, so you can have a testing option, uh, but again, you're gonna have to pay for the cost of testing. So that can become expensive um, if an employee is unvaccinated and you want them to test on a regular basis. And also testing is scarce. So it's, it's an option that some people, some employers have used when they have employees that work. For instance, one of our employers has a pretty large uh, distribution facility, so they can't have employees separated. So they wanna keep track of testing and everything like that um, as much as they can. So one thing that really is important to be aware of if you're mandating really anything in the workplace, um, but that vaccinations is sort of the flavor of the week right now or, or month or months. Uh, gosh, this has been going on for way too long. <laughs> um, but employees who are entitled to accommodations. So medical exemptions, medical delays, religious exemptions. Those are sort of the big three if you're mandating anything in the workplace. An employee can say, I cannot do that because of my medical condition. I cannot do that because of uh, or a medical disability or medical delay. I cannot do that because of my religion. As soon as you hear that, put the brakes on and you've got to start an accommodation process for that employee. Um, so if you've got an exception due to disability, you handle this pretty similar to other disability accommodation requests. You know, someone saying, I, um, I have back problems and that means I need to take a break every 15 minutes and walk around. That's something you can accommodate. But someone saying, you know, I have a disability and my doctor's saying I cannot get the COVID-19 vaccine. You have to accommodate that. Um, so ask for a doctor's note. The exemption does not have to be permanent. Like in the case of pregnancy, we've seen a lot of those where women get an exemption for uh, nine months uh, to get the vaccine because they have a high-risk pregnancy or anything like that their doctor recommends. 
um, but it doesn't have to be a physical disability. We've granted accommodation requests based on anxiety or anything like that. It just has to be uh, well documented and papered, and you have to have a doctor's note or a medical certification from a healthcare provider. But what religious exemptions is where it gets really tricky and can get pretty hairy. So it doesn't have to be in a, a recognized religion, uh, but it does have to be religious and sincerely held. And that's the California Code of Regulations, which defines it. Uh, it doesn't have to be Christianity, Buddhism, anything like that. Uh, it can be a spiritual belief. Uh, if it holds the same place as a religion in that person's life, uh, then it has to be accommodated. But there are limits to that. There is a court case that came out you know, a couple of years ago saying that an employee's veganism was not a religious creed, even though she was a vehement vegan. Uh, so this can become very difficult and delicate if you want to challenge it. Um, so some, some of our clients have taken a pretty aggressive tack and challenged these. Other clients have not. Um, so it kind of depends on how many you anticipate getting um, or, in, or and how aggressive you want to be. So if you get a valid request, so someone comes in saying, due to my religious beliefs, which are X, Y, and Z, I cannot get the vaccine, uh, you got to offer that a reasonable accommodation. And accommodation is not reasonable if it would be an undue hardship. Uh, so we've denied these uh, where they constitute a direct threat to the safety of others. So if someone could not get vaccinated and they also had a religious uh, 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 objection to getting tested, which was the alternative option. So that person had to be let go because they could not know, do their job anymore uh, without those safety precautions because they had to work in close proximity to other employees. And so far that's been sort of the tact this one of our clients has been taking on this. If it prevents the employee from performing essential job functions. With respect to vaccination, this really would only apply in the healthcare scenario where they're required to be vaccinated by the government. Uh, but for instance, in any other accommodation situation, someone saying if they have to be, you know, at a certain place to do their job and their accommodation would prevent them from being there, then that's not a reasonable accommodation because it can't then they cannot know they can no longer do their job. Um, again, this is very delicate. So I suggest reaching out to legal counsel when you're sort of making these determinations on, you know, what accommodations are reasonable or not. Um, so accommodations can depend, at least in the vaccination realm, on the particular exemption requests, but they include, you know, frequent testing, having people stay apart from one another, uh, increased face coverings. We've had an employer do a mandatory N95 requirement. Um, you can have people work remotely, alter their schedules, sort of the, the, there's a lot of different options now that there's no federal mandate. Uh, one of the more aggressive options that we've seen is putting employees on unpaid leave. And I know a few airlines have done this. It was Hawaiian and American, I believe, that are the two airlines that have done this. And both were actually recently upheld by the courts. So again, this is probably an easy way to find yourself in court and be sued because taking people's paychecks away is a pretty fast way to find yourself uh, sued. But if you want to be hyper aggressive, that is something that's sort of on the cutting edge of uh, requiring vaccination. So at the end of the day, you got to be prepared to fire people who don't get vaccinated. And that's sort of the end of the road for any mandatory policy. You know, if you're not prepared to let people go who don't comply with the policy, you should probably rethink whether you really want to start down that road. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about is really on the cutting edge is the new supplemental sick leave requirement in California. Um, this was just passed by the Senate yesterday. And that means that Newsom's probably going to sign it today or tomorrow or sometime this week. And based on the requirements, you will then have 10 days to begin implementing it in the workplace. So these, I just wanted to give you guys the high points uh, because there's, we can get down into the nitty gritty. I could probably do a two hours on this, but again, that's probably bore you all to tears. Um, so it applies if you have 26 or more employees. Um, and employees can receive up to 80 hours. So that's two weeks of leave for COVID-related um, ex uh, COVID uh, exclusions from the workplace. But there's a twist that you get the 40 hours the first week automatically. The second 40 hours, you only get if you have proof of a positive test. And that can be either say I was the person who tests positive, I would have to provide the proof of positive test for myself or if I was caring for my spouse or a child with a positive test, I'd have to provide their positive test to get that second allotment of 40 hours. 
Um, there's no guidance on what that proof has to look like. But again, any sort of physical proof, um, it could be you know the, the testing device itself, it could be a picture of it, it could be um, ideally the person would have gone to a lab, so you get the report from the lab. Um, but if so, one caveat to that, don't request without a waiver, don't request the information directly from the lab. That's a HIPAA violation. So request the positive test. This is the easiest way around that. Just request the proof of the positive test from the employee. As soon as you start requesting things from the medical provider, you're in HIPAA violation territory. So not a good place to be. So just request proof from the employee. That, that goes for any sort of medical information. Just request it from the employee. Uh, if you need it from the uh, provider, uh, there's model HIPAA waivers that you can find. Uh, some of them are not very good, but run them by your attorneys and they should be able to get you a good HIPAA waiver that you can use to then request information from or medical information from an employee's healthcare provider. So this new supplemental paid sick leave applies retroactively back to the beginning of the year and prospectively until September 30 of this year. So what that means is if an employee was out with COVID prior to today, going back to January 1, and they use their sick leave or other vacation time to be paid for that time, they can take that 40 hours that they had, or you know, if they have a positive test, they can take more uh, of this new supplemental leave and apply it backwards to that leave and then have their sick leave or vacation pay re essentially refunded back to them. Um, and, it, and that goes also as well if that prior leave was unpaid. They then get that supplemental sick leave, take a chunk of it and throw it back on that other leave and then they get to get paid for that, um, that, that leave. Um, so this pay, they, the employees get paid at their regular rate, and that is not the same as the base hourly rate. So if you play, pay commissions, if you pay bonuses, if you pay any sort of stipend in addition to a base hourly rate for a non-exempt employee, make sure you know whether or not that that has to be included in their regular rate. So for instance, if an employee earns 10, you know, $15 an hour, and gets a $100 bonus that covers a month's worth of activity, that $100 bonus needs to be applied backwards over the course of that month. So their regular rate will be more than $15 an hour. And it seems really stupid and minor, but we've had a regular rate mess up in a case of about three cents. And what that means is when an employee's terminated, you didn't pay them all their wages on their termination because you shorted them about 15 cents. So they get paid their full day's wages for 30 days. So when, when you terminate 200 people over the course of a four year court case, that can be millions of dollars. So literally we just settled the case for over a million dollars because an employer did not calculate the regular rate correctly. And our exposure was in excess of $6 million. I mean, so this stuff is small, but it can have a huge impact. So just make sure that you understand it and that you're doing it right. Um, so regular rate, uh, that really is only going to apply non-exempt employees, exempt employees, you pay this at the same rate as they would, as you would any other form of leave, um, but with a 511 day cap. So the reason it's $511 is because that's the amount of your tax exemption or your tax credit. So California, uh, is still working on the particulars of the tax credit, but if you pay this leave, you could. You can apply for a tax credit at the end of the year and get that amount back or some amount of it back at the end of the year. And so at the you know, earlier in the presentation, we were talking about exclusion pay. You cannot require employees who have been exposed to the workplace to use this leave, this new supplemental leave, instead of paying them exclusion pay. With prior supplemental leaves, you could do that. This one, you can't. So really what this means is you have to first when you get an employee who tests positive and is out or was exposed and is out, you're going to first have to prove that it wasn't at the workplace to then have them apply this supplemental paid sick leave. Um, so it just adds more complication to the process. Um, and in the end of the day, probably results in more money out of pocket for people off uh, out of work. So the leave used must appear on the pay sub. This is sort of a shift from how sick pay is usually uh, on the pay sub. Uh, usually you have your sick pay that you're entitled to listed on the pay sub. Now it's the leave that you've used. 
So as soon as the uh, uh, supplemental sick leave becomes effective, it's going to say on the pay stub, supplemental sick leave, zero, because I, you know, I haven't used any. And as soon as I use 20 hours, it'll put 20 there. And I guess the reason they did this is because of this sort of twist on how you can get the 80 hours. You know, they don't want to put 80 there and then have that not be it. But again, something that seems minor can result in big liability. If you get, if you don't put it on the pay stub or you do it incorrectly, technically the pay stub's wrong. And that means a hundred bucks for every pay stub for every employee uh, for a year, uh, plus another hundred dollars in penalties. So we just had a two to six claim that we settled, which sorry, that's pay stub penalty. I'm talking in lawyer speak, but um, it was like, it was like $3 million in liability for pay stubs. I mean, it's, it's so dumb and small but it, it's not dumb when you see the exposure. So again, pay attention to the details on stuff like this. It can land you in hot water. And again, it's really low hanging fruit for plaintiff's attorneys. Uh, to, as soon as they see a pay stub, they'll see it and then that's it. There's really no way out of it. So how, when can employees take this leave? Uh, these are sort of the, the paraphrased reasons from the statute. I don't think I, I'm not gonna read them out for you but it's just sort of the things that you might expect, you know, some who's quarantined or isolated, told by their doctor that they need to quarantine or has symptoms and they're waiting to hear back. Basically all the reasons someone should not be coming into the workplace, uh, they can be getting this supplemental leave if the exposure wasn't work-related. So stay safe, everybody. Really appreciate it, everything today. And you giving me the time to school you guys on a few things, uh, but yeah, happy to take any questions that you guys have. Hey, Jared, this is Bill Laser. I have a question about uh, notifying visitors to the workplace. You've talked about notifying employees. Is there any requirements to notify visitors to a large workplace? So visitors generally know um, if the visitor is a contractor or someone else that you're paying, then yes, uh, you have to notify them. But generally know that, um, especially with some of our retail clients, that's just way too hard to track yeah, I would think uh, who's in and out. <laughs> So no, there's no requirement. We have prepared some visitor notifications for people who, you know, the only visitors are people who have appointments, so they know, and just out of uh, trying to be safe, they're notifying them, but there is no requirement to do so. Got it. Thank you. Can I ask Michelle? a question back on your severance agreement um, yeah. topic? So, um, let me think how to put this right. Um, if an employee, if a former employee believes they were discriminated against, um, can we prevent them from going to the media when you when 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 you say that you, or is this just an illegal situation, or can a severance agreement um, prevent somebody from going to the media if they think they've been discriminated against? Unfortunately, not anymore. So um, they can still disclose all that, and again, it. <laughs> It reduces the value of your severance, um, of your non-disclosure agreements, but that's sort of precisely why uh, the California legislature thought this was important to put out is, I mean, the act is called the Silence No More Act. So you cannot prevent someone from disclosing to anybody. Uh, if it's just a severance, and it's, it's not just discrimination, it's any information about unlawful acts in the workplace. And they don't actually have to be unlawful. They can be something the employee thinks is unlawful. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm getting at. So if the, so, so, and I guess the, as an employer, you don't want to make a big thing by responding to it in the media. So it's kind of you know, best to just let it go. But, but if an employee basically wants to go whine to the local paper about something, there's nothing we can do to stop it. Um, I mean, there's, you can go to court for a temporary restraining order uh, or injunction, but in the agreement itself, no, there's there's no way to stop it. Okay, got it. I Jonathan, have a, go ahead and jump in. Thank you. I have a related question. That is, um, the new rule in a way reduced the value of the severance for for the employer, right? So, um, is there any guidance or or any policy that that um, that tell employer whether they are allowed to to change their severance amount because of the policy? There's no guidance on it, but you're absolutely free to do so. So 
you know, if a, if a hundred thousand dollar severance before this was worth that amount, maybe to you, it's only worth $80,000. Now the, really the amount of the severance is totally up for negotiation, depending on the employee, the situation, the risk mm -hmm. that you feel like you're mitigating. Um, so I, there's really no, you know, black and white. It has to be X amount and you're getting X amount of value for it. Um, so basically, you know, we've had severances for low value employees that have potentially, you know, a high risk, low value in terms of low uh, hourly wage, but mm -hmm. there's a high risk situation, you know, the, their pay stubs are wrong or something like that. And their severance has been a lot higher. Uh, mm -hmm. But for even high dollar employees, their severances have been lower when there's lower risk. So it's sort of a take each situation as you get it. And that's, and you assign the value to it that you think you're getting out of it. Okay. So there is flexibility there. And, and my second question is about the, the COVID um, exposure notification. I know that obviously because of uh, hip hop, uh, the, the notification cannot disclose a name or any identifying information about whom that person may be. But is there any law that require the employer to be more, uh, more active or, or forceful in terms of uh, preventing employees from like, you know, gossiping or or start sharing with other that so and so got COVID and you know and and things like that. Yeah, so this happens a lot. Um, most of the time, it comes down to sternly warning employees that you know you're violating that employee's right to privacy, mm -hmm. um, and doing so will not be tolerated under any circumstances. Uh, okay. Usually, that gets it to stop, um, and employees are relatively respectful of one another in that regard. Um, I haven't had to go much further than that um, with any other, uh, other than, you know, sternly warning a second time, but there's no sort of regulation that would put the employer in hot water unless the mm -hmm. employer sort of actively assisted that gossip or um, knew that it was rampant and did, you know, absolutely nothing to stop it. Um, that, that might land you in some hot water, but otherwise I think it's just a matter of sternly reminding employees that that's not to be tolerated. Okay, as thank you. As a practical matter, it doesn't uh, really no impact. You're going to send out a notification letter saying you've been exposed to COVID and the people who were the potential, uh, you know, who are infected or ill are not at work. So people are going to put two and two together anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, it, you know, like for larger employers, you probably mitigate that risk just due to your size. Because, right. you know, some people are out and nobody really notices. But for small, it's like, oh, Andy's not at his desk and I just got this notice. I wonder who tested positive. Yeah, so <laughs> it's true. I mean, there's really, practically speaking, uh, nothing you can do about that. But, but yeah, you shouldn't put Andy's name in the letter. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Back Any other to, questions? Uh, but yeah, back to severance agreements. You know, we talked about the impact of what the employee is allowed to say. What about the impact uh, on what the employer is allowed to say? Like, for example, say the em employee doesn't uh, want the employer to share anything more other than their they worked from X to Y and at this title. And then uh, is the employer now going to be allowed to say anything they want uh, relative to the release of the employee? Yeah. So, I mean, you can say anything you want. I mean, the problem is you're going to land yourself in hot water if the employer, employee finds that it was defamatory or anything like that. I mean, so we always counsel people, you're not going to get a whole lot of value from bad talking an employee. So why even go there? Right. Um, just say, yes, this employee worked from X state to this state. And, you know, right. that's basically it uh, and held this position. But again, it's something if you want to be able to disclose certain information in a particular situation, work it into the agreement. There's no, you know, and that can maybe have something to do with the value. Uh, say, hey, well, we'll pay you less, but we'll promise not to talk about this. Right. You know, maybe that can be a way to drive down the, the value of the agreement for you. Got it. Um, uh, Jared, come to, I have a related question. Based on your best legal 
uh, uh, knowledge, is this still a best practice for a company or even a, a, a former supervisor who still works for, for the company not to provide any references, um, you know, not to say anything good or bad? I'm asking because I, I wonder if, uh, if, if uh, this COVID pan pandemic has changed that. Uh, no, you mean if you like, if, if an employee uses you as a reference and you get a call from their prospective employer about them? Yeah, because uh, um, some companies have instituted policies like uh, um, uh, telling their employees not to provide any, any references. I mean, obviously, you know, um, um, everyone is smart enough to know not to say anything bad, okay? But yeah, but now, yeah. now they're even more more conservative about. Look, just don't say anything. <laughs> uh, whether yeah. it's you know good good or bad, all we do is confirm employment date and the title and and pay. And uh, my and um, my question is. Uh, um, has COVID uh, uh, changed that? Because I have noticed more companies putting such policy out about not providing not providing any references. Um, I don't think COVID directly has changed that. I think what we've been mm -hmm. seeing a lot more now is just a lot more turnover. So you're having okay. a lot more former employees. So it's becoming more prevalent that you're getting these calls. And it is mm -hmm. still the best practice to have a policy that states that and really only give out that information. Because what happens is if you don't have a policy or you have, uh, are giving out more information than that, and then a person doesn't get the job, it's like, oh, they must have been because what my other per what my former employer said, because um, mm -hmm. they said I did a good job, but they said it kind of sarcastically or something, you know, like, and you just, and then you find yourself in court and it's like, you just don't want to be there. So it's just, be simple, just say, yes, that employee worked from there to there and, you know, but have the, held this position. And then that's just the best way to mitigate risk in that circumstance. Cause I don't think it really gets you very far by, by giving out more information. Just to fine okay, tune, thank you. just to fine tune that question, there's a difference between, or isn't there a difference between the company position as if, you know, you call HR and you, you ask to confirm employment, blah, 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 as opposed to getting a personal ref reference from a coworker, a past supervisor or something like that. Can, can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah, the, there is a distinction there, but I would recommend having whatever that, rec or that reference be in writing. Uh, that's just the easiest way for it not to get twisted. Um, if it's a phone call, it's like, hey, I talked to Bill's supervisor uh, two weeks ago you know, as one of your references, but unfortunately we're not going to be able to offer you the job. It's like, oh, Bill, what did he say? You know, and then here you are <laughs> in some sort of dispute. So in writing is best policy there um, as, as a personal reference. But as far as company policy goes, uh, short, and, short and simple uh, pay date or uh, dates of employment. And sorry, I just want to, to clarify, uh, what you guys ha have just said, I mean, it's, it's only for personal reference. It, it's not for, for professional references, right? Right, correct. Personal, personal like uh, I'm a friend of uh, uh, so-and-so. I'm only commenting on, on, on his or her character and, you know, dedication or things like that. I mean, that person can be a coworker, but we're writing it as a friend. I mean, that's sort of the best way to go about it. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, Jared, thanks very much for a pretty thorough presentation.